right, let's go to the next one. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. So there was a time in my life too, Claudia's mom told me in Spanish, which I don't know exactly what she said, I kind of got some of it. But she said, um, did she say Tommy? I don't even know if she said Tommy. But she said Tommy, or, and she said, I really want you to take care of my daughter. My daughter is like me. Sometimes she takes care of everybody, but she doesn't take care of herself. Because she's always serving, 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 serving. And then she was telling me, I know I'm not supposed to do that. But then Claudia's younger as, your, as the husband. Make sure that you're teaching her and you're with her taking care of her. No Coca-Cola. <laughs> that was actually real. <laughs> Anyways, that wasn't the only thing. Do you still let me drink it? Once in a while. <laughs> once in a while, my dear, once in a while. <laughs> All right. So here's the idea. I'm supposed to love my body. All right. Anybody got a, a piece of poo-poo? Let me eat your piece of poo-poo every day. If I ate poo-poo every day, what would my body look like? Poo-poo. Yeah. Right? I have to take care of my body. <laughs> That's an extreme example. But then I can't, I have to take care of even my physical temple. I have to take care of what I do with my body, my health. I have to take care of her body now. I have to make sure we're eating right. I have to make sure that she's getting taken care of medically. I have to make sure that when she has a baby in the Philippines, it's a 50-50 chance of dying. When we were in the Philippines, we had friends asking us, aren't you scared? And then we were like, scared of what? Scared of giving birth. If you give birth, you might die. I didn't know. I didn't know it was 50-50 chance. 50-50 chance. You might die or the baby might die. I look at myself and go like, there ain't no 50-50 chance you're going to die. We're going to make sure that we don't die. So I have to make sure that we go to a hospital where she's not going to die. That's my responsibility. I have to make sure that we go to a hospital where Ariella won't die. Here's a really sad story, really sad. We went, there was another hospital right before we did outreach, and a baby, they had this whole morning because a baby died. What they, it, was a, it was a cheaper hospital. So they, what they did was the doctor, the baby came out and couldn't breathe. So the doctor gave the... the the ventilator or whatever it is, the thing that expands the lungs and takes out all the junk. And when the baby came out, the doctor gave it to the dad and said, okay, make sure you take care of this. And he walked away. The dad had no idea what this thing is. The baby died. So with me too, I look at it and I was like, that's what happened to Ariella. Because Ariella was going through so much trauma when she was getting born because we had to have an emergency C-section and then we were trying to do the water birth and that didn't work out. She came out and she couldn't breathe. And then they told me, well, only in emergency cut the umbilical cord. Other than that, you're not supposed to cut the umbilical cord. You're supposed to have the placenta there because the placenta gives nutrients. And then once it's done, then you cut it because that's where they're getting their nutrients right now. She said, unless there's an emergency, then we'll cut the, placenta, the umbilical cord. Right when Ariella popped out, they cut it. And I was like, uh, that's not a good sign. And then they took her immediately, and then they pumped her, and then she came out, and then she started crying. And then she's telling me, I feel like I'm drowning. I can't breathe, I can't breathe. So I'm dealing with her, feel, and she's telling me she's like gonna die, but she's not, it's just a medication making her feel like she can't breathe because of asthma. And then I'm looking at Ariella, and I've never seen her before, and, she, and there's an emergency, and she's not crying. And I'm like, what is going on here? This is like the craziest one minute of my life. And then in less than two minutes or 30 seconds, she's pumped, and then she's crying, and then she's breathing. That's my responsibility as a husband, that she has medical like I would have medical. That she has food like I would have food that she's taken care of with her heart and her body and her teeth and her everything else, like I would too. That's my priority now as a husband, it's her medical too. And her body, her health and her fitness, all of that stuff goes with it. And everything we do with our body. So you're probably thinking too, like, man, how am I gonna do this? And you know, hospitals are expensive when you have a wife, when you have a child. But what you need to do as a husband, too, is to research. 
like, w oh, how is it like for my wife to give birth? Like, so Paula and Josh are going through a series of like watching videos, preparing themselves together for him to go through it with Paula. They're doing a lot of research. So Josh is getting himself ready on how he can help Paula, how he can help the child. So you need to do the same. You don't just let your wife do it. She doesn't just go through it on her own. Like you have to go through it with her. You need to prepare and get her ready and the baby ready. Yeah. Sometimes people look at the wife like the admin. She does admin, but she's not my admin. Like she's not my husband admin. She's not my executive assistant. She's my wife. I have to research and look this up and think about it. If there's an emergency, what will I do with my wife? I don't know any, some of the things with water birth is you could do it in your own house. So I have the choice, okay, maybe I'll just learn it and then she can give birth with me. That will not work because I'm not stupid for one reason. I don't know how that's going to work. Yeah, that would be a dumb decision. So I'm going to be like, well, we need to have a professional give birth. Like, I have to think about that. Then you look at the professionals, you're like, wow, they're more expensive than free. So you have, to, you have to own that. I have to look that up. I have to find that stuff. That's me giving up my life for my wife. I have to serve her this way. Once you're already like, you know, three years into marriage or some people 30, whenever they're like that, you know, when you give yourself up, you're cherishing her, but every day you're giving yourself up. Every day you're finding a way to serve her. Every day you're thinking about our finances. You're thinking about our house. You're thinking about the children. You're thinking about everything. That's the way we give ourselves up as the men of God in the house. We give ourselves up that way. It says here, no one hates his own body. How many guys here, besides Jesus Christ telling you to go on a fast, won't eat. Right? It says, it says, as your own body. So let's say this. I'm a man. There's two things I like doing. Hanging out with Claudia and all that stuff and eating. Right? If I'm going to go, if I'm hungry, the first thing that comes out of my mouth, like a little baby, is I'm hungry. I'm hungry. Sometimes I'm at the room and she's processing with me. And then the first thing that comes out of my mouth is, okay, let's pray about it. Let's see it. I'm hungry. Like I just always, I'm always hungry. It says here, no one hates his own body. If I'm hungry, I'm going to eat some cereal at least or something. There's something I'm going to eat. But feeds and cares for it. Just as Christ does to the church. You can't let your family go hungry. If you're the hungry one and she's hungry and Ariella's hungry, you're not eating. In fact, you probably shouldn't even be sleeping. You should be probably trying to figure out how to get a job or something. There's, there's no room spiritually for her ever to be deprived of the word. I always have to be feeding her the word. And there's no room for ever as a physical person for me to deprive her of her basic needs. I always have to be doing that. And that hurts. If, you're, if you have the conviction of Jesus Christ on you, we used to bless her soul, right? We used to, when we first got married, we had to decide what kind of food we were going to eat because she loves broccoli, and also Ariella does too, but she likes broccoli. I don't like broccoli. Anyway, she came up to me and she said, she looked at the shopping cart. We have like $25 out of all of her money, or $20, I think, or something like that. And then she says, um, can I buy broccoli? And I said, uh, no, you can't, because if you eat broccoli, that's going to be gone in like a day. We need to get something like pasta that we can eat the whole week. And then she said, um, but I really want broccoli. And then she said, what about, what about a zucchini? And then I said, well, you got to get a big one that we can chop up and use at least for three days. We got to spread this stuff out. We got $20. And then she's like, okay. And then she puts the broccoli back. And then we get a bag of pasta, <laughs> the cheap kind, right? It's going to last us like three weeks because it's like a dollar or something. And then we do that. And that hurts. When you're the provider and you're the husband, that doesn't feel good. That's good. That's the conviction of Jesus. It's coming upon you and it hurts you because you look at Jesus Christ and you're like, you've given everything. You have all the wisdom. What do I need to learn from you so that my wife can eat broccoli? And that hurts and you let it hurt you. You let it go like it doesn't feel good as a husband to not provide. 
and you go to sleep and you think of it. One time I woke her up at 2 a.m. and I said, I have a financial plan for the next five years. And she said, financial plan? We can barely pay our rent. What are you talking about? We're going to get a car one day. And I was like, well, maybe I should have waited until 9 a.m. to tell you that. I told her that at 4 a.m. So I told her that at 4 a.m., like two, 3 a.m. or something like that. So, but I was thinking about it because it kept me up. It doesn't feel good as a man when you can't do the things that God says to do. But that's God's grace. When you're a pagan and a heathen and no Holy Spirit and your family's starving and they're not eating, you know how you feel? Hey, little girl, how are you looking? Mm, uh, 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 uh. And then you look at your other family and they're starving and dying and you're all like, you're so ugly now. No wonder I left you. That's how a pagan feels. They have zero conviction. They have zero fear of the Lord. They have zero Holy Spirit. When a Holy Spirit's living in a man and a husband and they look at their family, you grieve with the Holy Spirit. That's good. Because you want to. You want to be perfect like Jesus Christ. A lot of the things I see culturally here too with people that are non-believers and even believers sometimes uh, in the Philippines is very common for the woman to be the one working, to be the one leading, like the mom does everything in the house. That's why you honor women here a lot. But, and then you see on the streets, even as we drive, like I'm just thinking like, man, like there's so many guys outside, just sitting inside their house, rubbing their belly, drinking beer, or drinking some type of alcohol, or gambling with their friends. And their, their families inside the house starving, they probably only have rice and something to eat. And they're just wasting what they have in alcohol and gambling and doing nothing with their lives. That's what you don't want to become. You don't want to become that guy outside the house, rubbing your belly, drinking alcohol. And then when your, mom, when your wife tells you where's the food, you're like, we don't have any. You don't want to be that dude. Or I just spent my money on Or I just spent my money on this alcohol I'm drinking. So this is, these are, as a husband, the, and even as a single guy, it kept, it kept through me. This is one of the biggest prayers until now, I make every single day. Every day, I pray this like every day. All right, you guys got your recording out? You got your recording? You got your pen? I'm going to give it to you, all right? I'm going to give it to you. Lord, I don't know what to do. How do I do it? Then you sit there, and he talks to you, and you write it down. And then you do it. That's how you do it. There's going to be so much stuff that the Holy Spirit lays out in the Bible that we look at ourselves and we're like, how am I ever going to do that? You don't have that conversation with yourself. You'll go nowhere. You'll feel actually very bad about yourself. What you do is you stand before the Father, the throne of God with thunder all around them and precious stones and glory and wisdom and honor and worthiness. You look at the Lion of Judah and you ask the Father, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing. Can you show me how to do this? And then you write it down, and then you do it, then you grow and you learn, and you grow and you learn, and you pray, and you grow and you learn, and you pray, and you grow and you learn, and you never stop. You never, 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 never stop. That's the cross we pick up as husbands and men and fathers. And women do that too, but I'm speaking on my half, is that that's what we do. All of this stuff we don't know how to do unless the Holy Spirit breeds on it. And so don't try and do any of this in your own strength, because you won't. Who can live like Jesus? But you, you have Holy Spirit in you, you ask the Father, how do, I live with, how do I live like this? Holy Spirit lives in you, and you go ahead and do it. And that's how it works. You have everything you need inside of you. So just know that. And then it says, we are members of his body, verse 30. So all of us are part of the body of Jesus Christ. So again, you're not alone in your family. You have Jesus Christ there. As the scripture says, a man leaves his father and his mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united into one. Right? My mommy isn't married to Claudia. All of our decisions, all of our money, all of our vision, all of our provision isn't built from my mommy and daddy. They're already separated from me. I'm cut off now, it says in the Bible. And I'm joined and one with her now. So there's also a place in our singlehood where mommy and daddy are in, in the Bible, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but mommy and daddy are supposed to be teaching you how to be eating milk, solid food, milk to solid food in every category of your life. 
from finances to responsibilities to leadership to praying and listening to the word to asking God, how am I going to do this? All of that stuff is what a mom and a dad does. I'm not going to be a perfect dad. I'm not a perfect dad right now at Ariella. I already, there's a lot of times I've fallen short. My insurance with Ariella isn't me. My insurance with Ariella that she will grow up and be godly is that I lead her to Jesus. That I lead her how to pray. That I lead her to scripture. That I let her look at scripture and I sit down with her and I say, do you know what Proverbs 31 says about you being a wife? about you being a daughter, about you being a woman. Does, what does that mean to you? What is the Holy Spirit telling you? Look, she came back. Right, Ariella? What is the Lord? We, we have to teach her about Jesus right now. Right now, when we talk about God, she goes like this. Ariella, who's God? You got Jesus? Who's Jesus? Jesus? Can you worship Jesus? She's like shy. She goes like this. At one point, that has to go to like, Lord, what are you saying? See, she gets on her knees. Because that's what people are doing when they, when they worship. Yeah, she, this morning she was getting slain in the spirit. We were like, uh, we were listening to Bethel, and then she was, we were talking about Jesus, and then she was like this. Like, she was watching Stephanie. Um, Stephanie do that, yeah. but we do that too. We, we fall on the floor too. So um, yeah, she watches us. But my goal is to get her to be with God. That's what your mommy and daddy are supposed to be doing right now. If you don't have that, then you have obviously our father in heaven. He's supposed to get us to be full grown with our father in heaven. And then when we separate, we're full grown because our father in heaven. And then we join together as one. That's what we're supposed to be doing. You're not supposed to have mommy and daddy with you in the marriage. You're separated. I'm going to talk about that with, um, with the next one a little bit. All right. I'll move forward. This is a great mystery, but an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say to you, each man, you could underline the word there, must love his wife. That's the word there. Women, their error isn't respect. I know we got the R-E-S-E-P-C-T. To find out what that means to me. That was written by a guy. A guy wrote that and told a woman to sing it. That's different. That came, that came from a different aspect. It says this, and a wife must respect her husband. If I respect Claudia, this is the way I look. Claudia, what do you want to do today? Okay, awesome. Let's do that. Then I should go somewhere else. Or I'm like, Claudia, do you like that coffee? Is it good? Awesome. Tell me if you want anything else in that coffee. I respect her. She could care less if I'm treating her like that. She's like, what am I, your boss or something? She wants me to do this. This is what love looks like and cherish. Hello, my honey. How are you doing, my honey? How are you feeling? Are you, honey? Are you hungry? Uh, what, what's the most favorite thing you want to eat? Favorite thing? Korean food. Korean food. All right, my little parrot. My little Colombian bird. We're going to go and eat some Korean food. <laughs> You ever see Colombian birds? They're really beautiful. We were in Colombia. I always wondered why they always talked about Colombian or uh, Latin birds. When you see them fly, they're something else. They're like, they're like something else. It's really crazy. Very they're very majestic, colorful, and beautiful, and it's, it's just wild. So we saw a couple of parrots flying in uh, Colombia. I still think of it until now. So anyways, there's, you, that's way different, ain't it? What if Claudia came up to me and said, hey, my little teddy bear, How you feeling? Huh. Feeling good. All right, my little teddy bear. We need, to, we need to talk about our finances. Well, we'll do that later, my little teddy bear. No, that's not, re that's not respecting it. That she's kind of cherishing me as a little teddy bear. So that, that's not what the husband so much cares about. When they're doing stuff, they're not, they don't think about that stuff so much. Well, I'm thinking about we need to make some decisions. We need to move forward with our family. We need to make sure we're doing what the Lord is saying. And then she, she respects me. And she says, okay, husband, if this is a priority that the Holy Spirit's put on your heart, then let's go after it together. She respects me. I don't, I don't address her like I do when I'm talking, but I don't go up there and go like, what are the priorities of your checklist? 
Like she don't, she, she has priorities, but it's not like When we that. first got together, we were working on our newsletter, our first newsletter together as missionaries. And he was just like, okay, so what's next? Da -da -da. He was just like so black and white talking to me about our newsletter. And I got so offended because I was like, you're not like cherishing me through the process. You're not like loving me. Yeah, and who he's are like, you? who are you? And he was like, what are you talking about? We're just writing our newsletter. But he was so black and white and so like, number one, number two, this is what we're supposed to write. And I'm like, why aren't you saying it with love and kindness? Like, yeah, then I said, I said, we just need one sentence that says what we do. And she looked at me and said, who are you? What, who are you today? And I'm like, we just need the sentence of what we're doing. And then one of our mentors walked in and said, how you guys doing? And then we were like, we're writing our newsletter. And he said, okay, that's great. He heard us. Yeah, like, he must have heard us. And then he said, just remember, don't fight. And then I was like, what, did he hear us or something? <laughs> but then that was what was happening. Both of our hearts obviously cared about our ministry. But she wanted to be cherished. I wanted to be respected. That's something you could even do now. Obviously, don't call each other butterflies and all that stuff. But then just know that a woman is going to like it if you cherish them. Like, I don't know, pull up the chair. If a woman comes in, stand up. If a woman's talking, listen to her. Right? If a woman's cooking in the kitchen, help her. You know what I mean? Stuff like that. Like, be with her and stuff like that. Cherish your sisters. If, they, if, they're, if they're going through something, you know, help them be with other people and stuff like that. Like, pray for them and stuff like that. And then with men, they don't want to be cherished as much. If they do, they might have a mommy wound, because I had a little bit of that. But then they want to be respected. If they, if they need a little space, just give them some space. If they're working on something, don't tell them to do a bunch of other things. Just let them focus. Men can't do a bunch of things. Until you have a baby, and maybe you can do a bunch of things, maybe. maybe. They have this funny joke where they, uh, they say, um, it was, I was listening to Focus on the Family, and then uh, the, guy, um, the guy's like talking about, I'm going to take care of my kids. And so the wife is, there's one kid, and then the wife is like, wow, you're doing such a great job with Robbie. Where's, uh, where's, um, where's Jim? Who? <laughs> and then it's like, I don't know, I was like looking at Robbie. Because men, they don't multitask as well. So just let them focus. Respect the fact that they're just looking at one thing. And then that's, but that's also the reason why they're able to focus and innovate and break through stuff. It's because they have a lot of focus on things. But they're different. We're different on yeah. things. And you can still speak sweet to each other. Like I call Tommy names and I'm like sweet about it. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> So you still want to have that type of closeness and like uniqueness about your relationship, but you still want to know that a man really needs respect and a woman really needs to be cherished and loved and all that. Yeah. Like when I talk to Jarl, I'm like, Jarl, how are you doing? Great. Are we going to get these things done? He's all like, yes, I respect his manhood. When I talk to Rema or something, I'm like, hey, Rema, can you print this or something? Like it has to, to a degree, something has to change a little bit because women receive stuff differently than men. But if I talk to Rema, the way I might talk to some of our coordinators, the coordinators want respect as a man. Women don't necessarily care if they're respected like a warrior or a man, right? Do you want to be respected as a warrior lion? Maybe a lioness, you want to be cherished as a lioness, like something like that, but it's different. That's one thing if you want to understand even in singlehood how you can communicate with each other. That's something that needs to be there. You need to cherish and you need to respect. Those are two different things. You don't have to wait till marriage to figure that out. You can just do it now. That's something you can already do.